just to reflect and to go back to some of the presentations from the previous session, uh, Canada has poor coverage, it has high prices, um, poor affordability and poor cost control by international standards. It's not performing that well. I, I think we have to recognize that there, there is a problem. Um, in addition to the imperfect market that exists for pharmaceuticals in most parts of the world, we've got a single agency setting a ceiling price that is not actually responsible for purchasing or for budget control. So the, the, the issue of pricing, at least ceiling pricing, is separated from the responsibilities that normally go with that, which is to find the budget to pay for it. So you could argue that if it had been set up as a strategy that way by the industry, it was a divide and conquer strategy. Then we have all the jurisdictions that are each responsible for that purchasing. So it means uh, that we have a very incredibly complex system, it's not a very effective system. So it is clearly a major challenge and I think the complexity and the nature of the challenge has been laid out very nicely. Um, I, I'd like to pose to the, the panel some questions and I, just because of sake of time I'm going to direct them to a single member of the panel uh, but obviously other panel members may also uh, uh, come in with, with responses to these. As somebody who's only lived in Canada for a, a few years and greatly valued the time and the system here, I do want to ask a question though, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Michelle first. Uh, Michelle, to what extent um, does the challenge in Canada of trying to ensure good prices for branded medications, patented medications, to what extent the challenge is due to the fact that we've got such a large neighbor to the south that is such a powerful economy, such a large part of the market for pharmaceuticals, and at least for branded products, awards high prices in, in the sense that there is no price control. Um, to what extent are we suffering from that, and do you feel that? I guess to answer the question, maybe a little explanation, a bit more explanation on uh, how we do the price assessment and how we arrive at a price. So when I was presenting, I talked about the therapeutic class comparison or the international um, comparison, call it that, domestic or international. Domestically, uh, and in fact, the, the TCC or the therapeutic class uh, comparison is oftentimes the test we do. So from that perspective, what prices are being paid in the U.S. make absolutely no difference because we're only comparing to the prices of uh, products in a similar class in Canada. If you look at those instances where the price is established, our ceiling price is established by the international referencing, a couple of comments, I guess, to make there. Um, one is, and it gets to uh, some of the discussion on transparency, I probably am not telling anyone in this room something they don't know. Uh, when you look at the publicly available U.S. prices, which is the only thing we can reference and look at, everyone knows that those are not the prices. So what happens then is you are looking at prices that publicly are significantly higher than Canadian prices, although the reality is that some other price is being paid, but we don't know what that is. So that is a challenge. Um, having said that though, what that actually means is that when we do that international price comparison and we end up looking at uh, maybe the median of that, of that range as being where we're going to set the price, the U.S. just becomes a complete outlier because the prices are so high. So it doesn't really affect the price, although if you'll permit me, although you didn't ask this question, um, what is uh, affecting the price most when we do that international comparison is the European prices, but especially the prices in Germany. Uh, and Claudia mentioned this a little bit with the changes that are happening in Germany on pricing policy and AMNOG. The prices in Germany are going to be, from my understanding anyway, A, transparent, which is really uh, different, <laughs> and B, uh, expected to be significantly lower over the years to come. So with those changes on the horizon, when we do that international comparison, we expect, although it's again perhaps a little ways away, uh, to see a, a decrease in price in that comparison. Thanks for that very comprehensive answer. Um, I'm, I'm going to, the next question I'm going to direct to uh, Dan MacArthur. Um, the, the early experience with the pan-Canadian brand pricing alliance seems to be quite encouraging. Uh, 
Do you see that ever moving to a point of really effectively price setting or even a collaborative or cooperative purchasing arrangement? Has it got that power behind it? Well, uh, the system in Canada is that uh, provinces don't purchase drugs. Uh, it is one of the um, features of the system that I think, as Barb was describing, the most complex piece of understanding how the system works is the fact that as the payer, you're actually not seen as the customer for the products. In fact, the retailer is often seen as the customer in the system because we set a price and then the reimbursement happens through multiple players in the system. So I think there may be some limited instances where we might change from being a price setter to being an actual purchaser, but those would likely happen on very small volume drugs, likely in very rare disease areas where there's also a distribution challenge inherent in the access piece. Um, so, you know, I think that the um, there is a lot of potential here for there to become a coalescence and a single place where there is negotiation happening. The next piece to piece on top of that is can we harmonize so there's a single place where the actual uh, accounting is happening so that we can streamline efficiencies in provinces such that we don't each have to have a separate mm. subcontract that's about how the rebate is paid into the provincial coffers and then reassigned within the health system, but that that's done through a central place. I think that's doable. Uh, I think it's challenging, and part of the challenge is um, how you actually set up that governance structure without the um, strength of the pro federal government that provides an, um, the capacity to, re to legislate across all jurisdictions. Because as a province, I can't legislate what's happening in Alberta, uh, but the federal government can. Thanks. Now, in the remaining time, I'm actually going to go a little bit beyond the brief of this panel. Um, what was apparent with the uh, previous panel was that the key concern amongst the group assembled here today is the affordability of medicines, and clearly that isn't just branded products, but it, it certainly is part of it. I'm going to ask each of the panel members, starting with Claudia, uh, to actually say what their, or their organization, the body that they represent, what they can do in the next foreseeable period to improve the affordability of medicines for people in Canada who currently can't afford them. So I'm going to start with uh, Claudia Noy, Claudia, Claudia Noy, or forgive me, Claudia. Um, uh, one minute each. So thank you. Um, affordability of medicines and access to medicines, I think nobody in principle disagree that that is a priority for anyone. In, in industry, for the payer, we all would like to have the broadest possible access. What we can do is, I think, be engaged in the dialogue. But similar to what you've heard from the panel before, most of us are busy enough churning the day to day and trying not to drown to really sit down and dedicate people and resources and time for this very complex and long-term discussion. This is not something you can whip up and easily do. Anybody who's been engaged in the UK value price discussion knows how challenging getting all these people is to the table, how many years it has taken. So from that angle, I think, come to the table, be open to the dialogue, engage, and, and be solutions oriented, absolutely. And finally is, I would say, be careful with the devil in the detail. We all can agree on the high level 50,000 foot solution. In the end, how to make it work is where it all seems to grind to a halt and, and be very, very challenging. Thank you, Claudia. So the industry will come to the table to discuss solutions for affordability. Um, uh, can I move now to Michelle? Could you give us a perspective? Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll make uh, I'll make two points. Um, first of all, I think that uh, again, going back to a dynamic marketplace, I think it's important that the policy levers used by various players complement each other. So, um, and I will say that this is the first time I have the great pleasure of sitting next to Diane. Mm. So, and what I mean by that is perhaps I should next to, mm. sit next to her more often. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I think there is an opportunity to look at the various policy levers being used, whether it's provincially, federally, or in the private payer market, and to sit and, and talk about those. And having said that, I think the other piece to that is to do the impact assessment on price before and after 
you put in place those policy levers. Um, so I think that there is room to sit and, and have mm. that discussion. Uh, and I guess if the, uh, uh, although uh, I like the quote, we don't have to be nice to the pharmaceutical companies, uh, <laughs> we might nonetheless want to invite them. So perhaps they might even want to be in that discussion. But I really do think that the, um, the policy levers must be looked at in a, a coherent and integrated fashion. Uh, and so there's room for dialogue there, in my view. Thank you, Diane. What's uh, Canada's largest province going to do to improve coverage for people who currently can't afford important medicines? Well, I do want to echo that the only reason we're in this business is about the patients. Yeah. This is about improving patient outcomes. This is about improving quality of life uh, and uh, length of life. And so that's the primary reason that we're here. That's who's at the center of all of this discussion. I think improving affordability is not something that's within one province. It's this is actually an international challenge. Uh, first and foremost, the cost of drug development, the paradigm under which we go through drug development has got to change. It is far too expensive to go through the, uh, from the identification of uh, something that has potential to improve patient outcomes through to market. It takes too long, costs too much. So we have to figure out a, def a better way of, of doing that. I think we need as a society, and this is a global community, we need to be sending some clear signals about what it is we are actually willing to pay for. What is the value that we um, are, are really seeing as the most important? Because without that, industry will continue to chase the smaller and smaller improvement at the greater and greater cost. And at some point we have to send a signal about where's the trade-off and what's the, I hate to say this this way, but the maximum we're willing to pay sort of thing. That signal needs to be sent to industry and we have to deal with the profit motive balance that's inherent within industry. And then within our own jurisdictions, I think we have to deal with the issues of the inefficiencies within our own structures. So we are duplicative, repetitive, uh, you know, not necessarily as efficient as we can be, even though in the public systems we're quite efficient compared to the private systems. The balances are very different. So the more we can deal with our side of that piece, uh, the better off we will be. And then I think the other thing that's the improvement on access is about the timeliness of the back and forth. So if we are really seeing that the discussions are not happening within the Canadian market, we need to escalate ourselves to a different conversation piece so that we can improve the timeliness of getting the new products in in the right place.